Hey, this is Pastor Allen. I'm the lead pastor here at First Baptist Church of Naples, and we are so happy that you have chosen to join us as we go through God's Word together. God's doing some amazing things here, and we pray that God's Word will transform you from the inside out. Our mission here is to glorify God by making disciples of Jesus Christ of all peoples. And our hope is, is that you are being a disciple that makes disciples. Now, if you don't have a church home, we would love for you to join us either in person or continuing online as we go into God's Word together every week. But if you are a member of another church, we don't want this to be in any way, shape, form, or fashion a substitute for you being connected to your local body. So our prayer is, is that God uses His Word to change you and to change others. So we pray that God will use you and this message for His glory. Have a great day. Mark chapter 1 is where we're going to be. Mark chapter 1 and verse 14. I hope that you guys are doing absolutely fantastic. We had a wonderful 8.30 service, and I have just got a feeling that God's going to do something big at 10 o'clock. Anyone else in the room feel that way? Amen. Amen. Mark chapter 1, verse 14. Let's all stand as we read God's Word this morning. Mark chapter 1 and verse 14. The Bible says, uh, through John Mark, now, after Jesus was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the, son, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on a little further, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were in their boat, mending the nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and followed him. You may be seated. Have you ever heard of uh, a type of people called a bandwagoner, bandwagon fan? Uh, you're maybe not familiar with that. Uh, I know that no one in Florida is a bandwagon fan. Um, a bandwagon fan is someone who shows support or interest in a sports team based only on recent success and popularity. And so not too long ago, I met a man and we were, we were kind of jawing and we were kind of talking and I said, who, who are your favorite teams? You know, I, nobody ever has to guess who my teams are. Amen. I only got one team and it's better than your team. Amen. That's right. So I asked him, who are your favorite teams? And he said, college football, Alabama Crimson Tide. NBA, Golden State Warriors. NFL, New England Patriots. Major League Baseball, LA Dodgers. I said, where are you from? He said, I was born in Florida. <laughs> the man's confused. A few years ago, a guy named Kyle Eidelman wrote a book called Not a Fan. In it, he says that many people who attend church regularly are mere fans of Jesus rather than followers of Jesus. He says a fan is an enthusiastic admirer. They know the music, they wear the t-shirts, they even come to worship, but that does not mean that they are a follower. A fan will sit in the stands, cheer on the team as long as the season is going well, but if the season goes bad, they stop coming. What a lot of fans of Jesus want is a relationship with Jesus but on their own terms. Some want a no strings attached relationship with Jesus, but when it comes to him, he does not want fans. He calls followers. He's looking for disciples. And sadly, in the 21st century American easy bake oven culture, we have created a churchianity in which you can be a Christian and not be a disciple. But yet, Jesus speaks about discipleship the Bible talks about discipleship. The word disciple is found 269 times in the New Testament, and the word Christian is only found twice. So we're going to be talking about what does it mean to follow Jesus. I'm going to give you a succinct definition of a disciple. A disciple is someone who follows Jesus in faith and lifestyle and helps others do the same. My prayer is, is that when everyone leaves here this morning, you are a disciple of Jesus. Jesus says, uh, we have gone through these past couple of weeks is, is now come out of uh, the shadows. And now he enters into his public ministry. He identifies with us through his baptism at the River Jordan by that wild hippie in the wilderness, John the Baptist. 
And then he goes and is whisked by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness of temptation. And there, for 40 days, he's tempted by Satan, and he stands strong against the wiles of the devil and quotes the devil Deuteronomy. And I'll tell you that if Jesus had not st stood strong in the hour of temptation, that we would not have a Savior today in the midst of our temptation. So Jesus is now going to build his community. He is now going to build his kingdom. He is ushering in this kingdom, and his community of followers is going to literally turn the world upside down. And so as Jesus embarks on ushering in the kingdom, he's going to call four fishermen from the Galilees to follow him. And in these verses that we just read, very probably familiar verses if you're a church person, been in church all your life. And in these verses, we will see what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. And here's what we'll find is that disciples are called, they are changed by, and they're surrendered to Jesus. And we're going to see that in Jesus's simple invitation to these four men. The first thing we see in Jesus's invitation where he says, follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. The first thing that we see is in, that word, in those words, follow me. And what we learn is that disciples are called by Jesus. In verse 14, Mark wants to give us a time signature. He says, now it is when John the baptizer was arrested. Uh, this tells us something about what is going on in the scope of redemptive history, but even more so what was going on in, in real history and time. And that is that John the Baptist was arrested by a guy named Herod. And the reason why he was arrested by Herod is because John spoke against Herod in his sham of a marriage with Herodias. It's amazing how you can find a woman named Herodias. But what we see is that John is now in prison and John is decreasing, Jesus is increasing. And, and this word arrested is the, a word that can also be translated handed over. And it's the same word that's gonna be used speaking of Jesus and his arrest. And what we're seeing is that Mark is using this specific word to foreshadow that just as the messenger is going to be rejected and betrayed and arrested, so will the Messiah be rejected, betrayed and arrested and handed over to the Gentiles. John is not the point. He is the pointer. And now the point, however, is in this moment on the move. So Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming. He is going from synagogue to synagogue. And the Galilees in this time was a hotbed for religious vigor. And people from all over were coming to be taught by the different rabbis who lived in the Galilean region. The Galilees are probably some of the most beautiful places that I've ever been in the world. And if I could live anywhere, I would love to live in the Galilean region. And so these rabbis, Rabbi Shemil and Gamaliel and uh, Halal, all lived in that region. And people would come from all over to meet them, be discipled by them, and be taught by them. And so Jesus, who is a rabbi, has come to this region. And he's come not only to do great things, but he's come to say and teach great things. And so in those summary verses, 14 and 15, uh, we have four big churchy words, four big words. And these four words of Jesus's ministry and message are this gospel, kingdom of God, repent and believe. Here he says in verse 14, that Jesus came proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. That word gospel is the Greek word euangelion, which was a word that was already around in Jesus's day. And it was a word that meant a historic life-changing event. It was historic life-shaping news. It was not just daily news, but something so eventful that it required response from the here. It was not just normal news. It was big news. It had the potential of changing your life. And so what we learn is the gospel, according to Tim Keller says, and I said it so succinctly, he says the gospel is not advice, the gospel is news. It's good news. And so Jesus comes and he proclaims the good news of what he has come into history to do for us, not what we are to do for him. And in verse 15, he now, this summary of his sermon. Now, some of you maybe wish I only preached a sentence and then you would go home, but no, Jesus' sermon was much bigger than this. This is a summary sentence. And so he says, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. So the time is at hand means that in a real space, in real time, at the right time, for all time, God, through the person of Jesus, has come in and ushered in the kingdom of God. Well, what is this kingdom of God? Well, we think the kingdom of God is a place, and, and to a degree it is, but it's even more than a place. It's an event. 
See, when God created man, he created Adam and Eve and they lived in a perfect garden and God was the perfect king. And yet man, mankind, chose to rebel against God's authority, God's kingship, and make themselves the king. And so when you become the king, when I become the king, we're crummy kings. And so what happened is that when Adam and Eve tried to usurp the authority of God, darkness and death came into this world. And so we are now living under the tyranny of a rebel kingdom. And so the gospel of the kingdom of God, the good news of the kingdom is that the long-awaited king has come to put everything right and to renew the entire world that has been corrupted by sin and death. And so Jesus is now coming and proclaiming, all right, this long-awaited king, this long-awaited kingdom that you are looking for, that the prophets spoke about, that the people have prayed for, it has now come. And here's the good news. The good news is that if you repent of your rebellion, If you stop running from God and turn to God, believe you can enter into this kingdom. And so this great good news is not, okay, the king has come and he's going to wreak havoc and pour his wrath on you. No, the, the good news is that King Jesus has come to offer amnesty to all who surrender their lives to him. Now, this is what's happening. You would think after Jesus' inaugural uh, inauguration and his baptism, his defeat of the devil and temptation, and now his proclamation all throughout the synagogues, that you would think that Jesus would now storm the streets of Jerusalem, enter into uh, the Temple Mount, and would set up his messianic kingdom. You would think that he would tear off the, the, the tyranny of the Romans and he would set up his throne and rule and reign and he would do a bunch of miracles and, and a bunch of signs and wonders and all sickness would be eliminated and all disease and all suffering and there would be this shock and all moment. You would think that that's what Jesus would do is that after these, this proclamation that he would go into Jerusalem, but instead of going to Jerusalem, Jesus goes to the beach. And what does he do at the beach? He passes alongside the beach and he goes to the sea sea area of Galilee, to the Sea of Galilee. Now, this is a very strange way for the kingdom to come. According to Josephus Flavius, who's a Jewish historian, I've mentioned him already, uh, Galilee was a very prosperous fishing area. And uh, there were 16 ports, according to Josephus at this time, and there were 330 fishing boats. There were all kinds of villages all around the sea. One was Bethsaida, uh, which is the house of fish. And then uh, there was a Migdal, which is fish tower. There wasn't a fish sandwich, uh, but there was a fish tower. Uh, people did love to eat fish, uh, and they loved to catch fish. As a matter of fact, I love catching fish far more than I like fishing. Anybody else? I love it. It's a whole lot better. Um, Uh, If you've seen Deadliest Catch, kind of get the idea that this job as a fisherman in first century was was a dangerous job. People lost their lives at sea. So Jesus here is at the beach. He's walking along the seaside and the seashore. He didn't see Sally, but he saw Simon. And he saw Simon's brother, Andrew. And they were casting their nets. And so they, were, they had these uh, kind of nets like this. And they uh, took it and, and they would be about 20 feet long. And they would cast it out. And I would cast it, but I don't want to catch any Baptists. And um, <laughs> they cast it out there. Normally in this day when, when, when guys fish, they would either fish with a loincloth uh, or they would fish without any clothes on at all. But one thing that I want you to note is that often when we read this story, we, we kind of get in our mindset that, that Simon and Andrew were a bunch of poor guys and they were barely making it. But, but if you read the text, these guys weren't as poor as you think. They were probably more middle class. They were small business owners in a thriving fishing industry. And these guys knew how to sell their product. As a matter of fact, freshwater fish, which is what comes out of the Sea of Galilee, was a delicacy that was literally exported all over the Roman Empire. And most fishermen uh, in Jesus' day knew three languages, Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic. And if you read Luke chapter 5, you'll see that these men actually not only used the boats, but they owned the boats that they were in. Jesus then goes to another set of brothers, James and John. Now, these guys, instead of having those little cast nets, they have larger drag nets. And so they had just finished fishing. They were cleaning and fixing their nets for the next day. And listen... One of the worst things about fishing is cleaning the boat. Amen? It's the horrible. It's the worst. That's why I don't own a boat. 
but I know people that do, and I go fishing with them, and it's a whole lot better because they have to clean the boat. Anyway, what we do know is that there was some sort of partnership with Simon and Andrew and James and John. And so James and John were part of the Zebedee family fishing industry. And this probably both sets of brothers had this business and they owned their boats because it was been passed down throughout generations. And what you notice about the Zebedee Fishing Company is that the Zebedee Fishing Company had several employees. And so here Jesus is, he's walking alongside the beach. He sees first this one set of brothers and then he sees a second set of brothers. And what I just imagine him looking at them, they knew who he was. How did they know who he was? Well, John the Baptist told them back a few months ago about this guy, John the Baptist pointed and says, behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. And so James and John and Simon and Andrew, they actually spend a little time with Jesus for a day. What, if you read the scriptures, is that they spend the night with Jesus and they hear from Jesus and they meet with Jesus and they no doubt in their minds believe that he's the Messiah, but, but they went back home. And so they were not yet followers of him. But now Jesus has come to them and says, come be my disciple, be my apprentice, be my follower. And he was calling them out of mediocrity. He was calling them into a new life. And, and what did that mean? What, what did it mean to them then? Because he, here's what you have to understand. There was nothing wrong with them fishing. But they had, to have a, they had to make a decision. And this decision in this moment when Jesus came calling was this. Will you follow your dreams or will you follow the calling that Jesus has for your life? Because this calling in this moment required them to immediately give up what they were doing to follow him. Now, what did it mean to be called by Jesus? What did it mean to follow him? Well, for us to really understand that, we have to understand first century educational system. Now, I know this may not be as exciting as you want, but it will really help you down the road as you think through what it meant to be a disciple of Jesus. In the first century education system, there were three levels of education. Just kind of like how we have elementary school, middle school, and high school, they had three levels. The first level, which was kind of like their elementary, was called Betsaphor. Betsaphor was, it's the house of the book, and it was the elementary school, and it was only for guys, okay? And it was focused on reading, writing, and memorization of the Torah. That's the first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers and Deuteronomy. And so guys from six to 10 years old would go to Bet Sephora and they would be trained in reading and writing and memorization. And by the age of 10, they were to be able to memorize and recite Genesis to Deuteronomy in Hebrew. After that, if you wanted to go further, which some of them did and most of them didn't, you could go to the next level, which is Bet Talmud. Bet Talmud is the house of learning. And this was ages 10 to 12. And so these, this, this would be attached to a synagogue. And, and the goal for these young men, uh, young boys, were to learn and memorize the Tanakh, which is Genesis to Malachi. So by the age of 12, you were to be able to recite Genesis to Malachi. Now, this was an oral culture, and so that, but that's still a tremendous feat. At the age of 12, you would then go through your bar mitzvah and you would then officially be a man. You would go work with your father, get married and have kids at the age of 12. Things have changed. <laughs> the last school, which would be were like the top, 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 top 1%, because 99.9% .9 of the young men ended after the Beth Talmud because they needed to go work with their father. They needed to go start a family and continue on the, the trade of the business of the family. But those who really were the bride of the bright, the top of the top would go to Beth Midrash, which is the house of study. And they would uh, apply to be a disciple. They would apply to be a disciple of a rabbi. And so this would be like going and getting into the Ivy League school. And so they would uh, apply to uh, Gamaliel and they would apply to Shammai. Those are kind of like the, the Princeton and Harvards uh, of them. And then, and then, you know, maybe you would, if you really weren't that great, you were at the bottom end of the top percent, maybe you could go like to Joe, you know instead of these other big shots. But anyway, so what they would do is you would apply to different rabbis. And then if the rabbis kind of liked who you were, you gave them enough money, they would then sit you down and test you. They would ask you a bunch of questions. If you pass their test, then you would get an acceptance letter. Not, not really, but they would accept you to be their disciple. So that was the formula. You apply, you ask, you pay money, you can be a disciple. To be a disciple of that person meant three things. 
One is that you had to learn the Torah as well as your rabbi. So you would take on his yoke. You would know what he knows and immerse yourself in God's words. You would see the Torah from his interpretation. So if he saw it and interpreted this way, then you would see and interpret it that way. This will be very helpful down the road. So just tuck this little nuggets of knowledge away. So you would learn the Torah as well as your rabbi. Secondly, you would become like your rabbi. You would copy his every move because you would live with him 24 hours, seven days a week. You would be with him when he's asleep. You would eat with him when he's using the bathroom. You're in the next stall. I mean, you're right there together. You would imitate his style, imitate his demeanor, imitate his voice. You would do everything like your rabbi would do everything. And then the third thing is that you would carry on your rabbi's work into the world. <clears throat> And so you would stay with him, you'd stay close to him, and then there would come a time that you were to do what the rabbi did for you. You were to make disciples and carry on the mission of your rabbi. And so in this moment, when Jesus says, follow me, they have all of that knowledge in the background, what that meant. And so they knew what Jesus was doing when they were being called to follow him. And it was absolutely mind-blowing and shocking. These four men were not the intellectual elites of their day. Uh, they maybe, maybe went to Bet Midrash, or they didn't go to Bet Midrash. Uh, they, they went to Bet Talmud. And so uh, these guys left school to go work in their family's business. But what was even more shocking is not just who he picked, but the fact that they didn't apply. They didn't ask Jesus. He asked them. He called them. And that was unheard of. Why is it that the Bible wants us to see this? Here's why. Mark is showing us that Jesus has a different authority than just another regular rabbi. He's not just some religious teacher that's desperate for students and will lower his standards to get them in. No, Jesus has come with all authority and he chooses who will follow him. And here's what we all have to understand. None of us can have a relationship with Jesus unless Jesus calls us. Later on, Jesus is gonna say to them this in John 15, 16, you did not choose me, I chose you. Now, at the moment when you become a believer and a Christian, it feels like in that moment, man, I trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior. I have decided to follow Jesus. But as you look back in the, after years of being a Christian, you'll look back and say, had God not pursued me and chose me, I would have never chosen him. See, disciples are called by Jesus. Secondly, he says, not only follow me, but secondly, he says, I will make you become Disciples are changed by Jesus. I will make you become. Jesus here is revealing his intention. His intention was to change them, to make them to, into something that they were not already. See, Jesus saw what they would become through his power. This word become is not just a one-time event, but it's a process. Bob Goff, I don't know if you read anything that he writes. I love how he writes. I love his, his spirit. Here's what he says. He says that Jesus does not break things so that he can fix them. He fixes broken things so he can use them. See, being a disciple of Jesus doesn't mean you have it all figured out. You know, some of you, the reason why you're not a Christian yet, the reason why you haven't given your life to Christ is you have it in your mind that you gotta be a good person to be a Christian. And that's what the religious world says. The religious world says change and you can join us. But you know what Jesus says? Jesus says, join me and you will change. See, the only people that Jesus invited to follow him were sinners. The only people that will ever be saved are those who know they're sinners. These fishermen were regular guys that the other religious intelligentsia of that day would have just walked right past. These were not the all-star cast. These are not the guys you would want on your team. If you were gonna start a movement that changed the world, you wouldn't have called Simon Peter because these guys were idiots. You say, well, I can't believe you said that in the pulpit. When we walk through the book of Mark, you're all going to say it in your mind, what I just said out loud. And they will remain idiots until the Holy Spirit falls upon them in Acts chapter 2, and then you're going to see something happen. See, I love what Spurgeon said on this text. He says that when Christ calls us by his grace, we ought not only remember what we are, but we ought to remember what he can make us. We should repent of what we have been and rejoice in what we may be. 
It's not follow me because you will make something of yourselves, but follow me because of what I will make you. See, these men had no clue what God was going to do in their lives. They had no idea where they would go following Jesus. You know, when I was saved at Bradley's Pleasure Baptist Church in Kane Store, Kentucky at eight years old, I had no idea 30 years ago that I would be standing and living in Naples, Florida and preaching the gospel at First Baptist Church of Naples. There's no idea. You can't imagine it. Some of you in your life, you, you have seen where God has taken you from where you were to where you are. And here are these disciples. They had no idea. They probably thought it was going to be easy. All right, here he is. He's the king. He's the king of kings. He's going to usher in his kingdom. He's calling us to be in his cabinet. We're going to go down to Jerusalem. We're going to storm the Bastille, and it's not going to be very long, and we're going to rule and reign. Why not get in on that? And so, all throughout the book of Mark, they're going to ask the same question. Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? But it won't be very long until they're going to be on the run, and they're going to be tested, and they had no idea how hard it would be to follow Jesus, but all of them to a man would say he was worth it. You imagine, those of you that are married, any of you married in the room, say amen. Have you married? Okay, uh, some of you I'm worried about. Uh, <laughs> uh, preacher, uh, I gotta tell you something. Anyway, do you imagine your seven-year-old self, if you spoke to your seven-year-old self, and your seven-year-old self had to write an essay on what it's like to be married and to have kids? Wouldn't that be an interesting essay? <laughs> it would be this. Everybody, every day is happy. And you wake up next to your best friend and you have in this nice house and a white picket fence and 3.5 kids coming in. And they come up every morning and say, hello, father. <laughs> and they clean their room and they do everything you tell them. And it's all right. I mean, as a seven year old, you're like, that's what it's going to be like. But now those of you on the other side, you're like, well, that ain't what it is. <laughs> not what it is at all. Well, that's kind of what it's like following Jesus. When you first become a Christian, you have one idea. But as you start following Jesus, you'll see that there's a different way that God has for you, and you have no idea where God will take you. See, Jesus is going to transform these men to usher in his kingdom, and he's going to use these men to literally change the world. You and I are feeling the reverberations of what the Holy Spirit did through these men. See, it's through their apprenticeship with Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit that they turn the world upside down. And here's what you're going to find out if you are a believer this morning. You're going to find out this, that becoming a disciple is more of a gift than it is an achievement. Because it's what God is doing through us. And you may think, you know, what? God can't use me. Well, look at Simon Peter, Andrew, James, and John. If he can use them, he can use you. And I'll tell you, if he can use me, he can use you. Disciples are changed by Jesus. Third, follow me. I will make you become fishers of men. Disciples are surrendered to the cause of Jesus. Fishers of men. That seems to be a strange phrase. If maybe you're new to church, you're like, what's that about? It's not a new concept in, concept in Jesus' day. It was actually an image that was uh, spoken of by the prophets. The prophet Jeremiah in Jeremiah 16, 16 promises that one day God will send out many fishers that will catch people for judgment and punishment. Jesus here is going to transform the image. See, when you fish, normally when you catch a fish, the fish dies. But here Jesus is saying, instead of fishing for people to go to hell, you're fishing for people to go to heaven. Instead of bringing death, you bring life. You're catching people literally out of the fire. That's what Jude 23 says, saving others by snatching them out of the fire. See, Jesus came on a rescue mission. Jesus, John says in John 3, didn't come to condemn the world because the world was already condemned. Jesus has come to seek and to save the lost. And so he says to these guys, you've been fishing for fish. Let's try fishing for people. And I'm going to teach you how to do it. How do you catch people? Like Jesus caught people. How did Jesus catch people? He went where the people that needed to be caught were. See, here's what happens. A lot of you want to tell others about Jesus, but you don't really have a relationship with someone who doesn't know Jesus. 
Because what happens for a lot of us is that once we become a Christian, in about 18 months, most of our friends, most of the people in our lives aren't our Christians or the people that aren't Christians, we really don't hang out with as much. We have to go where they are. And so we may have to go to the gym or go to Walmart. There's a lot of lost people at Walmart. <laughs> and we may have to go to the beach. And we may have to go to different places. We have to go where they are. And then we tell them the good news. The good news, hey, that Jesus has come. The king has come. And then we tell them, listen, if you want into the kingdom, you have to believe in Jesus. You have to repent of your sins. Now, I know that kind of seems intimidating, but it's the truth. Jesus had a public ministry. He had a private, personal relationship ministry. He came to where people were. People came to where he was. He had random conversations. And so that's the thing that he's calling them to. He's calling them, hey, if you follow me, I will make you become fishers of people. But more than they were to be committed simply to that task, they needed to be committed and surrendered to him. See, this call of follow me was a call to an exclusive allegiance. I have to be number one. I can't be number two. I can't be number three. I have to be number one. We see how this call made sense to them when we see Simon and Andrew leave their nets and James and John leave their father. Leaving their nets meant that they were going to put aside their career and their career paths. And, and James and John leaving their father meant that they were going to kind of abandon one of the most important relationships of their life. And here we see a decisive break. This is a turning point. It's a watershed moment. That Jesus becomes the number one in their life. Now, I want to make a solid note here. Because you read books like Radical, and there's nothing wrong. David's a great guy. And, and I, I believe in that book, Radical. But you, you'll get the sense, if you're not careful, that our job when we follow Jesus is we got to burn the ship, and we got to burn down our house, and get divorced, and sell all our stuff, and go be on mission. That's not what these guys do. They don't sell their boats. They don't set them on fire. Now, some of you wives saying, well, it wouldn't hurt my husband sold his boat. They didn't divorce their wives. They didn't sell their houses. They still had nets and boats. They, the sons of Zebedee left their business with their father and their employees. Peter still had a house and he still had a wife and he still had a mother-in-law living with him. James and John still had a dad and a mom. Well, what's the difference? The difference was this, is that they had those things still in their life, but those things didn't have them. That Jesus was number one in their life. That when they left their nets in this moment and they left their boats and their families, it was not just a mere commitment. It was a laying down of their lives. Tim Keller on this text said this. He says, if you say, I will obey and follow you, Jesus, if my career thrives, if my health is good, if my family is together, then the thing that's on the other side of the if is your real master. But Jesus will not be a means to an end. He will not be used. If he calls you to follow him, he must be the goal. See, the problem with American Christianity is we've set the bar very, very low. In our desperate plea to get more people, we have basically just said this. If you pray some prayer, ask Jesus in your heart, accept Jesus, then you will automatically go to heaven when you die. When you have any trouble, Jesus will be there. If you feel bad, you can pray to Jesus and he'll heal you. If you feel depressed, he'll give you joy. And if you, if you mess up, then he will love you unconditionally. And those things aren't necessarily untrue. Those things are true, but those aren't the main things. And what I'm afraid is that we're preaching churchianity rather than Christianity. Because here's what happens. If you follow Jesus, you're going to have moments it stinks. Amen? And if all you've been told is if you follow Jesus, it's gee whiz and hallelujah till you die, then when you don't get what you expect to get, then you just say, well, does Jesus even exist? The biggest threat Kyle Eidelman says to the church today is fans who call themselves Christians but aren't actually interested in following Jesus. They want to be close enough to Jesus to get all the benefits but not so close that it requires anything from them. So let me end with this. What does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus? Three things. The same three things it meant to be a disciple in first century Israel. One, 
To be a disciple of Jesus means that you learn from Jesus. You learn from the rabbi. You read, study, memorize, and meditate on God's word. You read the gospels. You spend time with Jesus in prayer. You talk to him. You have quiet time with him. You watch his life. You hear his voice and you pray every day, God, show me who Jesus is and show me how to follow him. You learn from him. But secondly, to be a disciple means that you live like him. You live like Jesus. You emulate him. You copy him. You mimic him. Dallas Willard said that living as a disciple means emulating Jesus. We don't just hear what Jesus said to do and try to do that. Rather, we also notice what he did and we do that too. It's, listen, I, I'm not advocating the um, bracelet, but it's to a degree, WWJD, what would Jesus do? You know, your kids copy you. Our kids say things that we say. Like sometimes like, where did you get that from? Who told you to say that? And they look at me and say, well, I heard you say that. They do things a certain way that we do certain things. So have you ever caught yourself folding clothes or folding laundry and you fold maybe a towel a certain way? Like I remember when I first got married, my wife folded towels one way, I folded them a different way. You wanna know why, you, you, you know who won? <laughs> you don't have to guess. And now I fold like her mother did. <laughs> Why? Because you learn from your parents how to fold things, right? You do what they do. You, 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 you look like your parents. And I feel sorry for my boys. Um, <laughs> you sound like your parents. I mean, because you copy them, right? You copy them. That's what it means to be a disciple. You are discipling your kids. You understand that, parents in the room, that the church ain't discipling your kids. You are, it's your responsibility. It's not Google's responsibility, it's yours. And they mimic you. And we should follow Jesus so much that when people see us, they should see that we follow Jesus. But how we live and how we act and how we talk. And I wanna tell you, you can only do that through the power of the Holy Spirit. But that's what it means, third you learn from Jesus, you live like Jesus, and you carry on the mission of Jesus. The first thing Jesus said in calling them to be his disciples was what? Fish for people. You follow me, I will make you become fishers of people. The last thing Jesus says before ascending to the Father is go and make disciples. Isn't that amazing? It comes full circle. See, Jesus would spend three years of his life preparing him for the mission. Jesus would minister and they would watch. And then Jesus would minister and they would help. And then Jesus let them minister and Jesus would assist. And then Jesus would watch them minister. And then he died. <laughs> and he says, greater works you're going to do than me. They followed Jesus. And in following Jesus, they were able to fish. And here's what I want you to understand. If you're not fishing for people, it may be because you're not following Jesus. Nick Ripken, who wrote The Insanity of Obedience, says, do you know that why Jesus called his disciples to follow close to him? So that he can send them out with him. It's clear that an intimate relationship with Jesus necessarily leads to a life of ministry, service, and mission for all believers. If you struggle serving Jesus, if you struggle uh, uh, living a life like Jesus, if you struggle being on mission for Jesus, if you struggle sharing your faith with other people, it may be because you are not walking closely to Jesus. Because when you walk closely to him, then you will leverage your life and your resources and your energy to make disciples of Jesus. We're going to look at this later on, but in Mark chapter 8, verse 34, Jesus called the crowd to him with his disciples and said to them, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. Notice that Jesus' invitation is, a, is an invitation not just for the elite. 
but it's for anyone. He says, if anyone would come after me, if anyone would follow me, if anyone would drop their nets and follow me. See, being a disciple of Jesus is more than just going to church and giving a few dollars and volunteering every now and again. Following Jesus requires a denial of self. So what's your nets? What's the net that you're holding on to? What's the dream, the net, the career, the, the money, the relationship, the sin, the addiction, the, the, the thing? What, what is the thing that you're holding on to? And where are you? Are, are you still on the boat? You like Jesus, but you don't think he's worth it. Or, or, or are you half on the boat and half off the boat? You, you want to follow Jesus, but you, you don't want to leave that boat behind. Or, or maybe you're, you're crawling back into the boat because you, you stepped out in the water and, and it got hard and now you want to go back to the boat. Or are you following Jesus? Let me tell you something. It costs to serve Jesus. But you know what it costs far more not to serve him? It costs to follow Jesus, but it costs a whole lot more to not follow Jesus. So what's your net? What are you holding on to? Because the only way you can be a disciple of Jesus is you've got to drop your net and follow him. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I pray that your Holy Spirit would do what I could not do. And that is call people to yourself. And Father, I pray that for those in this room who need a relationship with you, that they need to follow you, that today God would be that day that they would follow you. That they would let down of the net, whatever it is, money, career, relationship, addiction, some sort of sin, whatever it is that's holding them back from being all in, Lord, let them let it go and give it to you and trust you with the results. Father, I love you, and I want to become like, like you, and I want to be a fisher of people for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand. Thank you for joining us as we go through God's Word together. I pray again that God will transform you from the inside out. So as we say here at first, you have come to church. Go out and be the church. Have a great week of worship. We can't wait to see you soon.